Okay, we are live. Again, another Friday evening. About to get into it and talk about some African spirituality with some amazing guests. Um, I'm going to start bringing in um, our guest today. Greetings to you, Divine Prince. Um, it's going to be a pleasure to have you in today and talk to you. Um, just to, to let everybody know, whoop whoop, I love it. Um, just to let everybody know uh, who's going to watch this afterwards and who is watching this now. Um, my name is Nosek Benadian. I am a writer and director, filmmaker. Um, I'm, I've made films uh, based on African spirituality. Uh, essentially, um, my, 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 my focus has been on a project called Rise with Orisha. And as I sort of start making more films about African spirituality, I have um, decided to to start to talk to people who have an interesting perspective on African spirituality. Uh, people who I can learn from and people who I also can help share their information to other people so, so, so they can learn and, and we can all sort of collectively come together uh, and dispel myths, but also just discuss about things which can can help us in these tumultuous times. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna try and bring in the Van Prince in a minute. Oh, uh, okay, all right. I've set the request. Um, you just need to join. Um, I hope it's a great Friday. How are you doing? Greetings, peace and blessings, Alafia. Greetings to you as well. Um, how how how's your Friday going so far? All is a blessing. All is a blessing. Amazing. Actually, um, thank you as well for today. Um, I tuned in a little late to your live, and I saw saw you playing my trailer. So, thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'm just spreading the work. Um, so I mean. This is going to be um, available available for people to watch afterwards as well. Um, so I'm just going to get straight into it, if, if that's okay with you, yeah? Yes. So, um, first and foremost, um, I know you do a lot of different things and you wear a lot of different hats. Um, obviously, you know, you're a voodoo doctor, you are also um, you also run a, a church as well, um, but could you could you give us the full totality? And you're also an actor as well, um, for what I um, researched about you. So could you give us sort of full totality about who you are and what you do? Well, I am Voodoo Chief, the Divine Prince. I am the king and leader of authentic New Orleans Voodoo practice. I am also a licensed and registered minister. I run a ministry, a voodoo-based ministry, but a ministry nonetheless. Um, I am also a actor and cultural performer, um, particularly in, in the range of ancestors, masquerade. And of course, I do regular uh, roles as well. But everything that I do ultimately is for the benefit of voodoo. Um, so yeah, just to let anybody know, if you're joining, and as you join, if you have any questions for um, Divine Prince, can you just put them down below, or especially put them on the question mark, which is easier for us to bring up. Yes. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah. So, so to get into that, yeah, a lot of people have uh, 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 a lot of people have a concept about voodoo, which is erroneous. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess if, if you could spend like a couple of minutes just sort of dispelling some of the myths from people who are ignorant and don't understand. People have a lot of concepts about voodoo with, which are not only erroneous, I would be willing to say are conscious and deliberate attacks on, on the culture and the tradition, as it has been since the beginning. But I also think it's very important to distinguish West African motherland voodoo and then that which manifests, which regrew, which 
recreated itself in the new world. And so we know that voodoo is only in this so-called new world, this Western world, by way of the Middle Passage, by way of enslavement. And everywhere that the ships landed, everywhere that our ancestors landed, also their culture and their tradition landed. Um, I like to say that if we could count in Ewe or Yoruba or Fon or Khan, you're only now being forced to learn to count in Creole, Spanish, French, and then subsequently uh, English. And if you can remember how to count, if you can remember your math, you can remember your drum rhythms, you can remember your dance rhythms, you can remember your rit ritual cycles uh, for connecting with the sun, the moon, the spirits, etc. A great distinction I like to make in terms of voodoo is north of the border here in North America versus what manifests indeed south of the border. Uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, um, Candable in Brazil, Maria Leonza in, in Venezuela, and, and of course, Lucomi in, in Santeria in, in Cuba and in Puerto Rico, and many other traditions that we are willing to give legitimacy to. Whereas the racism kicks in, where the white supremacy has always kicked in from day one, is around insurgency. It's around the runaway slave. It's around the renegade slave. For indeed, south of the border, there was an arrangement with the Catholic Church. There was an arrangement with the Vatican that if they convert to Catholicism, we'll allow them to continue this voodoo God thing. It, it seems to keep them in, in, in some sense of order. That was not afforded the enslaved African north of the border in, in the U.S. We had a very different dynamic to how enslavement existed here in the, in the dirty South, as we like to say, in the antebellum South, and even indeed in the North. So the idea of insurrection, revolution, at the hands of voodoo only made that much more dangerous a concept for us north of the border. So at that point, you see this, the black codes, you know, the, the brown paper bag test. You see much more egregious regulations put into place to monitor our mobility, to limit our coming together, uh, to, to limit our connecting to what they saw as not just some great and mighty voodoo power, but some power that made us think that we were impervious to bullets, and impervious to, to danger, and, and hence, a, a deadly danger to the system of, of white supremacy, of, of enslavement in America. Now, something that makes New Orleans unique, which I like to brag on, you know, different from Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, is Congo Square. Congo Square is literally my front yard. It's, it's less than 50 yards away from where I live is Congo Square. And it is the one place where, you know, the good Catholics of New Orleans, you know, didn't feed us on Sunday because we didn't work on Sunday. You didn't go to the fields on Sunday. You didn't work on Sunday, so they didn't feed you. But they allowed us to gather in Congo Square, what we now call Congo Square, and grow crops of beans, greens, tomatoes. You know, they allowed us to drum, kalinda, drum, bambula, drum, you know, the conga and dance, you know, but there was always still that threat of the watchful eye of, of Massa and, and those who would run back to Massa about what type of voodoo was going on in Congo Square. Well, you know, what exactly are they trying to conjure up, if you will, in Congo Square? So it set a precedence of performance and indeed gospel, jazz, both born out of Congo Square, as well as voodoo being born out of Congo Square, um, had to be uh, packaged in a way that made it less threatening. We can go and beat the war gods and, and, and chant Shango and, and Ogu every Sunday, you know, and not expect some kind of negative repercussion. So our tradition had to go underground Whereas in Cuba and, and Brazil, Candable, Lukumi, they had an opportunity to organize a little bit better and a little more out in the open 
to larger size groups of people. Um, it also forced the traditions themselves to go underground. The practice. So we had to we had to create Gree Gree and Wanga and ways to conceal your voodoo, to hide your voodoo, you know, so that it wasn't necessarily readily visible, you know, to, to the outside viewer, to the outside uh, watchful eye. So there's a very clear and distinct uh, difference between New Orleans voodoo, Louisiana voodoo, uh, and, and then of course, Haitian voodoo, Dominican 12th division voodoo, and how voodoo shows up in, in many other nations, um, black and brown nations south, south of the border. So, so that's my voodoo 101 in, in terms of how voodoo got here. Um, we, we like to think, we like to anchor on the Haitian Revolution. And I like to remind you that that was 1791. But there were enslaved Africans coming to Louisiana in 1690. Some would suggest maybe even earlier, since it wasn't entirely in a legitimate practice. People weren't readily, you know, admitting, you know, how many slaves they had and that they were involved at the, at this point in in the uh, in the history. So we know that the first ship of our enslaved ancestors that arrived here came from Benin, came from Benin, right there where the Temple of Python is right there where, you know, many other uh, what we call voodoo traditions still exist strongly today. Uh, the Haitian Revolution only further complicated things for us. Uh, it didn't make things better for us in terms of coming out in the open with, with voodoo. Indeed, forced us to have to go a, a great deal more underground. Do you think, though, that because it's, it, as you're as you're speaking, yeah, and you're speaking about New Orleans, like I get all these popular images or these images in popular culture, you know, films, books, music come up, and it's almost like as it's <clears> pushed on the ground, you know, when you push something, try and push something away from you, but then it becomes even more tempting, and you're small, sort of like yeah. curious about it. it feels like that's what happens because um, there is an allure to to New Orleans that. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't explain. Maybe you can. Um, um, you did a good job for someone who, you know, doesn't necessarily live here. Um, but, but you did a great job. Uh, as I suggested just a moment ago, um, I would say that that was really the birth of voodoo as a form of performance. Um, we start seeing voodoo in literary works. We start seeing voodoo depicted in, in movies. And of course, any aspect of our culture, Black culture, was demonized then, and particularly something as, as frightful and as powerful as, as voodoo. So a great deal of creative license was taken, um, as well as that which was being influenced by, by racism they certainly were not going to display any aspect of our culture uh, in 1700, 1800, 1950, uh, 1980, that was going to be positive or empowering or reinforcing about our experience, particularly this Black experience here in America. I have to make that distinction because there's a clear distinction between our brothers and sisters on the continent and their treatment under enslavement, colonization, white supremacy, et cetera. The islands, the larger land masses like Brazil, and, and what we distinctly suffered under and still continue to operate under here in, in the U.S. So that there has been, since the beginning, a concerted drive to demonize, plagiarize, appropriate voodoo to r remove the power, if you will, from it. Now, as you said, you know, like drugs, you know, I've heard that, you know, the heroin addict that dies on the dope, you know, everybody now wants to try that dope, you know, it's got to be something, you know, powerful to it. Uh, so, yeah, the allure of the voodoo, uh, the appropriators, the outside voices who wrote about voodoo, who, who made movies about voodoo, created an environment that did make it that much more alluring, that much more enticing. But also, um, as someone who's been living in the city of New Orleans for 25 years, um, I understand the dynamics of economy, 
we still have to understand that this is the second poorest state in the nation. I believe Mississippi would be number one, Louisiana would be number two. Okay, so we're, we're, we're at the lower end of the spectrum economically. Uh, so that absolutely affects health and wellness, medical access, food access. Even now in 2020, I live in a food desert. I, I have to go a few miles outside of my community to find a, a grape, an orange, you know, a, a tangerine, you know, produce, um, healthy foods. Um, and so the notion of economy and earning a living and staying alive has always been strong in a port city like New Orleans. Indeed, uh, it's always been, in my opinion, the most diverse, the most universal port city, much how we view New York City today. Um, New Orleans would be that city of the South, and particularly in the time of Marie Laveau, or even earlier than that, where the great superhighway of, of the country would have been the Mississippi River. So all of our, our uh, resources and oil and gas and, and a great deal of our, our products, even today, I believe the percentage is 67% come through the port of New Orleans and up the, up the Mississippi River. And so jazz traveled, gospel traveled, voodoo began to travel. Um, and so it became exposed, not just here in the city, but now outside the city. Uh, once upon a time, there was, you know, this was indeed the most feared, the most desired, <laughs> the, the most dream-inducing city uh, in the country. And people wanted that New Orleans voodoo. They wanted that New Orleans mojo. They wanted that New Orleans grigri. Uh, so I think it served two roles. One, to, again, uh, give those who would otherwise oppress us an opportunity to stay present, to keep an eye on, on what's going on. And that ultimately evolved into industry, commercial industry, uh, voodoo shops, botanicas, you know, all the like, uh, many of which are not operated or owned by people who are not only not in our community, but don't even believe, you know, in, in many of these practices. And then the second thing is um, back to the economy. It, it provided performance opportunities for our people to come out, you know, and, and dance and drum and sing and chant and, and play instruments, you know, for a fee, you know, and then go back in and feed your family. And the tourists, the observers feel they've had a real authentic voodoo experience or a real authentic connection to, to New Orleans and they go back to their way. And so it keeps the community pacified to some degree, but also uh, has kept voodoo from growing, uh, if you will, out in the open in a way that would otherwise be threatening uh, to Karen of the day. The idea of Karen is new, but everybody was Karen back in the day. Yeah, You know, everybody was Karen. And, and what are you doing? And what are y'all saying? And why are you dancing like that? And, and why are you dressed that way? You know, we were chattel. We were property. You know, even in a city like this, with a large free population of, of Blacks, Marie Laveau was indeed a free woman of color. Um, there was still that ever watchful eye, I would say even more so, you know, of, of the Black, the Brown, the Red, <laughs> the High Yellow, you know, the, the, the Passant Blanc, you know, on the culture and the tradition. And that still exists today. That still exists today. There, there's still those uh, guardians of the culture, both within it and without it, that are watching it. Uh, I might need a little bit more light that are watching it, that might want to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, to what degree we're doing it. And today, in, in, in a more um, pop culturally hungry environment for tradition, um, it, it's, it's all about money now. So the botanicas have sort of subverted the system in, in terms of elders, teachers, um, protocol, processes, 
if you will, in these traditions and have become a quick and easy outlet to buy stuff that people believe has power or, or is empowered. So I, I like to remind people that in the beginning, it was about self-defense. It was about survival, you know, um, and, and, and how we view it today has been greatly altered from its, its normal and natural course of things. There are those of us uh, that are attempting to steer things back. I know indeed I am. My, my goal is to create a, a revolutionary revival within our community where we realize that we have other options than those mainstream religious and spiritual options that have been uh, presented to us. Yeah, amazing. No, um, as, as you're talking, uh, there's so much information that's coming to you. Um, I think that, you know, I might have to do like a bibliography later on because there's a lot of stuff which you're saying and you're referencing, which is, a, which is fantastic. Um, but I also want to, so, and it also makes me think about you as a person um, in terms of how did you sort of get into uh, a voodoo um, and also get drawn to New, Lo New Orleans? Because it feels like, you know, at one point you must have said, I need to be there. Uh, and I, I just really want to hear that story, if you could tell us. Uh, it's, uh, I'll back um, yeah, sure. Well, you know, um, just as I'm kind of complex, my story is complex. My family is from Louisiana. My family is from Mississippi. Uh, both sides of my family, mother's side and father's side. And when we look at the history of the movement of African Americans, there's a, a contingency, if you will, of my family that traveled north into Chicago, Missouri, St. Louis, Detroit, um, and subsequently, I ended up on the East Coast. Now, um, I was born in Chicago, Illinois, grew up in the furthest northern part of the South, a, a part that people forget is, is in the South, and, and that's Maryland, um, is where I grew up, Gullah Geechee land, we, we, we would know it as today. Um, and so one of the first things that I heard as a child was voodoo. Voodoo and ghosts. When I think of two, three years old, first stories that I heard um, in my family, and there was a great deal of controversy uh, around these topics. Uh, it was clear that they were topics that weren't to be discussed. Some family members didn't want those topics discussed, particularly the more religious, evangelical Christian, uh, uh, Jehovah Witness aspects of the family didn't want it discussed. And then I had my great aunties and, and uncles who absolutely wanted to discuss it uh, and wanted to ensure that we were aware of it. Um, so th the first thing I heard, the first thing I knew of before church, before um, pop culture was voodoo and, 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 and the story of voodoo. I also had the what I call the fortune of growing up in Chocolate City in, in the middle of the civil rights movement. Uh, being born in the late 60s uh, in Chicago um, and then being raised in the what we call the DMV, the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area um, in the early 70s afforded me a very rich, culturally rich, black, I'm black and I'm proud, you know, environment long before any idea of Black Lives Matter. Um, it was James Brown and I'm black and I'm proud and Aretha Franklin and Gladys Knight and the Pips and, you know, the black movements of the 1970s. Um, that area geographically exposed me to Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites before you knew what they were. Um, wow. uh, you know, uh, it, well, I, back then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> back when they were still the Ansuru, you know, back before he was Dr. York. Um, the Nation of Islam, you know, was, was still growing and evolving in, in New Jersey, right up the road, Pennsylvania, right up the road, you know, from where I, I grew up. So the idea of, of being Black, 
being conscious of who I was um, was something that I was raised on. My mother is the first college educated woman in my family. Uh, and I believe on both sides of my family uh, in, in terms of her age group. And so we had to be exposed to black history, the museums, but also the symphony, the opera, the library, you know, during the course of the 70s. So I was allowed to think freely, or at least free of the system, if you will, the, the structure of the system. Uh, and then my family fell off into religion, meaning my parents, my mom and my dad. And that's when things went downhill. <laughs> things became problematic. Uh, we first were a part of the Black Spiritualist Church and then the Evangelical Church, which evolved into what many of you know today as a prosperity ministries. Um, so at the age of 14, I'm on the street. Um, I can't stay at home. My father's too violent, too crazy, too psychotic, you know, and I'm now out in the world. And because of that structure, because of that upbringing, I didn't become a statistic. Um, I didn't fall off into drugs. I didn't get into crime. I didn't, you know, I saw elders and people who were older than me and, and people at that time who, you know, you might have said were a bit artistic or, you know, the hippies or, or the culture folk. And, and it was still safe in the early 80s to go out into the community and, and connect and and find people within your uh, community that you could trust uh, in a way that young people of today even might not feel that same sense of, you know, security. So it afforded me the opportunity to ingratiate myself to elders, many of whom are well known today, you know, in, in, 18, in ATR, uh, some before they had a name, um, others absolutely had a name back in the 70s and, 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 and the 80s, but are even more well known today. Um, it, it gave me an opportunity to be exposed organically to more than one system. Uh, so I've been exposed to Santeria authentically. I've been exposed to Lukumi authentically. I've been exposed to what we call Nago or West African Yoruba tradition authentically. Um, in college, I was exposed to Igbo for the first time, you know, and, and I like your your last name, you know, uh, oh, yeah. when I did my DNA test, which is, you know, one of the tenets of how I do ancestral work and divination in my house, uh, we, we not only use the traditional means in, in divination, but we implore this modern technology of DNA. And I found that I'm a great deal Ibu, not so much Yoruba, but, but a whole lot more um, Ibu. And so I met a whole family of Ibus while I was in college who embraced me like family. Um, they, they thought I was from there. They, they thought I was lying. They, they thought I was pretending <laughs> to be African American, you know. Yeah. Um, and that was always my experience anytime I met someone from the continent, from Ethiopia uh, to Senegal. You know, um, I was in college during the uprising in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Ivory Coast, and I, and I met a great deal of um, uh, brothers and sisters from that country um, who were fleeing, you know, the war and, and the mayhem, uh, who were in, in the States, you know, at that time and, and absorbed uh, their culture. Um, I think that, you know, growing up in an abusive family, abusive household, being on the street at, at such a young age, you are forced to develop survival skills. Um, and one of my survival skills was, and still is, the ability to absorb other folks' language, other folks' tongue, but also other folks' culture and, 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 the, and the knowledge um, of, those, of those cultures. Um, people swear I'm from New Orleans. <laughs> you know, I can pick any side of town, uptown, downtown, west, west side, Algeria, and, and I can sound like that. You know, but that's what a good actor does. That's what a good performer does. But I've also been here 25 years, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all I've known is culture. All I've known is tradition. And I've spent time ingratiating myself to the elders, the people that are the oldest in these practices, in these traditions, in these communities, and, and those who are, are the most active 
of course. And, and so those are the things that I um, credit for my journey into voodoo uh, and also why I've managed to stay in it. Um, take it from just a fad, a trend, uh, a curiosity to indeed um, a lifestyle. Amazing. It's um, just listening to your story, I could visualize like almost like a movie, everything that sort of like you were telling me about your story. And it, it, it's almost like you had like a journey through not only the black African American experience, but through the African experience throughout your, 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 your sort of, you've had it so far and you are having it so far, um, which I think is, is, is fascinating. Um, I wanted to, to ask you, what do you, during your time, what do you, what have you seen has changed within voodoo, um, within the perception of voodoo, within how it's practiced to now? And you mentioned that you are sort of looking to change uh, or bring people together um, with it underneath that, 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 that umbrella. How do you plan to do that? What's sort of, uh, what sort of tools are you going to be using, should I say? Um, you, you just asked several things there, but that's okay. I, I'm <laughs> trying to hit, hit all of them. Um, cause you first, you started off with, you know, changes. What I've seen change is, the first thing is when I came to New Orleans, the first thing I asked was, where's the voodoo house? Where the voodoo church? And there was none. Or the one that they wanted to point me to was operated by a white woman. Very nice white woman, you know, Sally Ann Glassman. Many of you are familiar with her. She now operates the healing center, but still operates an active Haitian, Haitian, Voodoo Temple. And that's why I'm not at odds with Sally Ann. Sally Ann is, is operating a Haitian Voodoo Temple. I'm here to represent New Orleans Voodoo, Louisiana Voodoo, that belong, which belongs to me and that which belongs to us. And, and, and as I tried to lay out earlier in the conversation, that's indeed important because Cuba will claim Lukumi. Brazil will claim Candable, yeah. you know, but what does the African American have to claim except church, you know, except church. So I don't argue over a you, you know, and, unless we speak in French, there's no argument over how many yous are in, are in the word voodoo. And, and often that argument is used to disempower the Black American experience. To say that we have no voodoo, we have no power that wasn't transported here from Haiti. I understand? So how I've seen it changed is in the last 30 years, voodoo has gained a, a face that I would like to believe that I played a, a key role in creating that has made it look more desirable, has made it look more accessible in a way that did not exist when I first came to New Orleans. Voodoo indeed was Haiti, indeed was Togo when I first came to New Orleans. Now, finding tourism, very easy. Finding entertainment, very easy. The skeleton key, the frog and the princess, you know, they're glad to borrow, you know, not only my personality and my character, <laughs> Dr. Facilier, but also from the city and from the culture to feed entertainment. And, and as a SAG card carrying member, I'm okay with entertainment. I'm okay with art and entertainment and creativity. There's a place for that. But I want to be sure that the authentic demonstration, the authentic footprint of voodoo in Louisiana, in New Orleans, in the Black American experience, it's not only documented, but survives after me. You often hear, well, there's not much to find. You, there's no real voodoo in New Orleans anymore. It, it, it's dying. And that's not true either. I would say that in the last 30 years, there has actually been an upsell, for lack of better words, of, of voodoo. A, an upsell. 
and, and I say for lack of better words, but I use that word specifically, again, to sell product, tourism, haunted tours, ghost tours. You know, we, we love the story of Marie Laveau. Some would even suggest that Marie Laveau helped to bring a bit of appropriation, commercialization to the demonstration of voodoo in New Orleans because she did make it accessible to people outside the community. And so today, you know, you have your fortune tellers that sit right out in the open in Jackson Square a a as a legitimate part of quote unquote tourism and New Orleans culture. But you see a very limited footprint, visible footprint of voodoo anywhere that you don't actively seek out. And often what's easiest to find, what's right in your face is for the tourist and for um, this little shady word that I've coined, Orisha romance. <laughs> when I say Orisha romance, I'm not being very nice. Um, I, I'm trying to be nice, but I'm being real shady, you know, and it has to do with us. It has everything to do with us, the African American and others who are thirsty for this, this need and hunger for connection to the motherland, connection to what's indigenous, but won't get up off the couch or off the computer to really do the work to connect to those cultures and traditions organically. And so we Google it, we Bing it, we're looking for it in IG, we're looking for it in, in Facebook. And often there, you're going to get exactly what you're looking for. Those, those salespeople who are waiting on you, who are popping up and showing up in your DMs, they're showing up in your DMs right now because you're on my page or you're on uh, Nosa's page. They're showing up in your DMs right now offering to connect to the ancestors for you, off offering to do divination for you. You know, they got barely a dozen, you know, pictures on their page and you all accept it. That, that's why they keep coming, because you all accept it. You all believe it. You, you like those profiles with no real picture, no real identity, no real footprint. And white supremacy has told us that anything real does not exist within us. We have to find it somewhere else. We got to go to Haiti to find it. We got to go to Panama to find it. We got to go to Mexico to find it. Oh, but it ain't here. The only thing we got is cornbread, collard greens, watermelon, Right? Church. <laughs> you know, and white supremacy. And so my job, and I say it's my job, it's my vocation by, by the voodoos, by the ancestors, is to uproot that, upturn that. And, and heaven forbid, this were my last day. I've done a good job. I've, gonna, I've done a good job. My oldest... Godchild is 86 years old. Wow. My youngest is 19. I've got the mom, the grandma, the uncle, the aunt, both parents, five or six kids in a household doing ancestral work, hmm. connecting with their ancestors again, understanding that we're more than church we're more than red and blue. We're so much more than what happens, you know, for the election. Okay. okay. And that this is indeed what, what has powered us and what has fueled us all along. It's just been hidden or accepted as something else or, or called something else, you know, but it exists in our blood. Our ancestors are in our blood. Science is just now catching up to that, that ancestral memory survives in the blood. This is now a scientific backed up fact that spiritual people from all over the indigenous world have always known that your ancestors don't ever leave you. They're present with you and, and for you. They've been waiting on us to reconnect. They've been waiting on you, child. And see how I did that skeleton key? They, they, they take all of our stuff and they mix it up and they scare it up and they horror it up, you know. But, but at the end of the day, the truth is right in front of us. 
we just need to embrace it and and step into it. You know, it's so easy to talk about a Beyonce or, or Erica Badu, who, who neither, as far as I know, have ever, ever publicly come out and claimed Orisha and claimed voodoo. But it's, it's so easy now for the Orisha romantic community to place that onto them because it's what you want to see. It's what you desire. So just like the 800 commercials, the 900 commercials, Miss Cleo, Call Me Now, you know, they, they painted up to mirror your instant gratification, you know, make a great deal of income and money off of it, but at the same time are putting one more nail, one more attack on what's otherwise an authentic way of life, way of being, and one more reason for you to fear it and not want to accept it. So, so my dream, my goal is that these abandoned churches would be converted into community centers, would be converted into ancestral centers. We all got ancestors. You know, in, in this day of political correctness, we all got ancestors. All my clients have to take DNA. All my godchildren, it's mandatory. But most of my clients take DNA. I don't care where they're from. White, black, Hispanic, Asian, they all. I, I get a client in, in India doing DNA. Okay. We, we got to get true about who we are. I also think that the ancestral work helps to avert the power of white supremacy. I think everyone with the, with the social security number should have DNA attached to it. In, in my world. I think it would make it easier for for us. It, it would make it harder for white folks to say how white they are and to hold on to that white supremacy. But but it also helps to rebuild the connections back to who we are in, in terms of people of color. Okay. Um, yeah, because I was going to, I think you sort of answered it, but I was going to ask um, in terms of the DNA, you, you know, you take that as, as the beginning of the ancestral um, work that you do with people. Um, it's not the beginning. Um, I, I do divination, which is traditionally how it has been done since long before. And we're doing the work, we then include the DNA results. And of course, it's right. not, it, it's easier said than done. It's not just as easy as getting one test done you know, and, and it's going to jump out and say you you Igbo or you Yoruba. It really takes a great degree of, of work and research to, to get more specific about where we come from. Um, you have to not only pay attention to timing, where was your family or your genetic ancestors at a particular time in history? Because we know that these ethnic groups have moved around, you know, through war, through politics, through... through by Skype, uh, through, through, through colonial, um, you know, maneuvering and oh, and Skype goes, going off again. Um, uh, did I break up? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah you did, sorry. Um, okay. But yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you were saying through um, war, through um, different ways out there. Through political manipulation, through uh, colonial manipulation, we've moved around. So you have to also have to pay attention to, for instance, where the airway may have been at a particular time in, in history as it relates to your genetic ancestor. Um, and, and so there's a lot more involved in just taking the DNA test but that extra information gives us something to work with to sort of piece together a, a general location and a general ethnic group for which we can then pull from. We um, teach in Yoruba, you know. Uh, again, I note that your last name sounds Igbo to me, reads Igbo to me, but, but your show is Rise of the Orisha. Yeah. People say, oh, well, you, you know, Divine Prince claim voodoo, 
but you spend a lot of time talking about Ifa. And, and so those things are all, and always have been interconnected, interconnected. Well, when I speak to my Nigerian brothers and sisters, Ghanaian brothers and sisters, who, by the way, surprisingly, I often know more about the tradition than they do. Mm -hmm. Particularly if they are under a certain age. They know Islam. They know Christianity. I, I've had, you know, brothers in Accra tell me, well, that's in Northern Ghana. We don't know nothing about that. You know, they, they've completely disconnected from traditional ancestral worship, traditional, you know, African-based religious systems. So I'm often reteaching them these traditions. So for them, it's all voodoo. Mm -hmm. It's all voodoo. Or juju for them. It, yeah. it, it, it only gets specific when you start looking at an ethnic group. Is it Yoruba? Is it Igbo? Is it Ewe? Is it Fon? Is it Akan? And then it's specific. Then it's specific. So the Yoruba are the most degreed in the Western world. I would say literate. So they've written a great deal of material. There's a great deal of information out there about Orisha. But when you try and research something, study something in Edwe or a Khan or a Fon, things get much more difficult, you know, to Google that, to Bing that. And now you're meeting up with other languages like French, for instance. But even before you get to Fon, many Fon speakers are, are going to be speaking French. And so we have a great wealth of Orisha-based information in the West, and, and not so much when it comes to the other ethnic groups. And, and, I, and I make it easier for people to see, the American eye to see, when I talk about Nigeria being one country in West Africa that has over 200 ethnic groups in it, 200 languages within it. Now, English is the national language of Nigeria. But then you got over 200 dialects and ethnic groups operating within that. And for some reason, the Orisha Romance has only latched on to the Yoruba. Hmm. What about the Enwe? Hmm. What about the Igbo? You know, and, and so when we start doing the DNA portion, that's when uh, my trainings my coursework gets much more specific. So we stop teaching from Yoruba, and then we start teaching Fon, or, or teaching Ewe, or teaching Igbo, you know, and, and their deity names. So many of my... But we stood there. Um, it seems like we've. It seems like we've. Um, hold on, let me see if I can get you back. Because it seems like you've gone off for a minute. Um, anybody that's listening, can you hear? Okay, you're back. Yeah. Back. Um, Great. something was going on with the internet. I'm not sure why. I'm not even sure at, at what point you lost me. Um. You're speaking about the, um, the different, um, the different uh, uh, spiritualities which are not sort of being um, displayed in popular culture, or people are not checking it out, checking out for it because of um, Orisha romance. Which yeah, yeah, you know. So, so all we know is Oshun, Shango. You know, we, we know very little about deities, powers that exist right next to these people, you know, sometimes as close as one marriage, you know, to the Yoruba, because it's not popularized. It's not made its way in, into the popular movies, into, into mainstream culture. Now, someone like me who, who like you all, thirst for culture, um, I love Nollywood. I love Gollywood, I, I, and I don't just watch the Yoruba movies. I watch the Igbo movies. I watch the uh, Airway movies. And, and if you don't type in 
those ethnic names, often you're either going to get a, gen a generic Nollywood, you know, N-O-L-L-Y, W-O-O-D, and it's not going to be very ethnic group specific, or it's going to just automatically give you a Yoruba movie. Um, and, and just like doing your research, you know, if you don't know what words to use, it's very difficult to even search uh, West African cultures and traditions uh, in, in a Google or in a Bing search. Um, for instance, Odu, O-D-U, which, which is a word that applies to uh, sort of the, the coded formula that falls on the divination table, you know, in, in this binary system of divination. When you type that into Google, you don't get much of anything Yoruba at all unless you add a word before it or after it that's relevant to your search. And so often these other ethnic groups aren't coming up in the search because people aren't asking for it. People don't know what language, what words to use to induce those, um, those results. So, so I ask people to, you know, um, be more ethnic specific, you know, and, and where you don't know, ask. So I might ask, what are the ethnic groups in Ghana? What are the ethnic groups in, in Cote d'Ivoire? And, and start there. Um, surprisingly, when I do that, a great deal of the information that is supplied um, has been gathered by religious groups, particularly Christian and evangelical groups who see Africa still to this day as a target for colonization. You know, and they list these ethnic groups by those who've been exposed to Jesus and those who have not. In, in other words, those who are still heathens versus those who we forced, you know, to submit, you know, to, to, to the ways of, of their father. And, and so that information is still listed in a very colonial, missionary targeted way w with the sole purpose of um, eradicating ancestral belief, eradicating old ways and traditions um, from the motherland. And so it's a scary thought that, you know, you might find more traditional practice in the Americas. It's a scary thought that, that you, that people would actually believe that Lukumi is somehow, you know, the most perfected structure of Ifa demonstration, even more so than Nago tradition even more so than the West Africans themselves. There are Cubans who will actually say that out of their mouths yeah, yeah, yeah. and actually believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, one question I want to ask you is, just as you were speaking, it came up in my mind. Um, there is such a diversity and a uh, broad spectrum of beliefs and belief systems and spiritualities, um, African spiritualities, which, you know, you just sort of alluded to. Um, and I guess one of the uh, most, should I say, forceful things about the monotheistic traditions is the way that, you know, there's one, essentially, yeah? Like, Islam is, you know, you have Shia, Sunni, but, you know, you essentially just have Islam sort of like as a really dominant force. Whereas sometimes when I think about it in Nigeria, like you mentioned, there's loads of different spiritual my, my in, me myself my, my family are from um actually from benin edo edo uh, state in nigeria mm -hmm. and, and even sometimes there is a, a, a conflict should i say between sort of edo uh and yoruba even though we're, we're we have the same origin essentially mm -hmm. it's conflict between Edo and he, and it's, it's it's like do you think that so many different spiritualities is actually a detriment because it's not one focused energy and um if we look, at, say, if we look at spirituality as a political thing as well yeah, as I, just i'm gonna say thing. i'm gonna say no and no um okay. first i think your precedent is not quite there when i hear you say competing forms of spirituality so what I mean by that is, okay, so we say Christian, but you have Mormons, you have evangelicals, you have Catholics, 
you have Seven Day Adventists, and they are all at each other's throat. Trust me when I tell you. Now, now your background being from Benin, maybe you, you haven't seen that. But, but as an African born in America, I'm telling you that absolutely exists. Um, th they are, however, willing to unify under Christianity. And, and the same thing applies to Islam. You, you, you have Shiite, you have Sunni, you have Sufi, you have the demonstration of, of, of the NOI and the FOI here in the Americas, which is not always that popular in, in other parts of the world. Some people still say, well, that's not real Islam. There's always someone to say, that's not real Islam, that's not real Christianity, that's not real voodoo. There's always someone to say that. I will agree with you, however, in that if we don't have a more unified mindset among what I call this umbrella of voodoo, Ifa, Lukumi, Santeria, Paulo, Kandable, if we don't latch on to what unifies us, about those traditions, then then yes, we'll always sort of be struggling against, competing against, you know, these well-structured world uh, religious traditions that not only have a great deal of, of, of time and history behind them, but at this stage, money and resources behind them. Uh, when we do look at economy, the Europe are wealthy compared to many people in Benin you know, or Ghana, you know, and then the subsequent ethnic groups that we could pull out, you know, of, of those regions. Um, okay. Let's um, start to... Okay, let's start again. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Get, I get a lot of interruptions. I can stop the computer, but the phone and the Skype, it, it's hard for me to, to shut it down. Just, yeah. just before you go on, sorry, I just wanted to say um, the uh, Instagram Live is going to cut off because it's going to hit the um, one hour mark. So if, if it does, before you finish talking, I'll just log back in uh, and then you can join again just to, to finish off. Um, and now how, how long are we going to go? Um, I was. I had a couple more questions to ask you. Okay. Um, so yeah, no, but, but I, I just wanted you to finish your point about um, uh, you were mentioning. Sorry, you were mentioning the um, Yoruba having more sort of wealth than more uh, wealth. Um, here in the U.S., they are considered the most degreed ethnic group. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Um, so, you know, sort of that spread of, of not only the spread of, of the knowledge and awareness of Orisha, but what they're able to do for the tradition right there on the ground in, in Yoruba land um, ha has made it much more a prevalent demonstration and footprint than, than even 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and so if we don't unify under sort of this umbrella of ATR, traditional African-based religious systems, um, then yeah, we'll be struggling to compete uh, with, with, with this sort of global mindset that uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has always, have already sort of laid out in, in the world. We have to unify on, on many fronts other than just belief. You know, there, there are economies that fuel these religious systems, you know, and so we have to put more in place in, in order to ensure that that survives for the next generation. Hmm. Um, okay, so from uh, 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 the perspective of, um, of a voodoo chief, of a spiritual African traditional spiritualist, can you just give me your, uh, how you see 2020 in all the tumultuous things that are happening right now? Um, some people see it as, a sign of things changing as an opening, um, but what do you see as? How would you describe it? Um, both of those. It's absolutely a transformation. It's happening. Um, doors are opening, um, as well as closing, uh, which is really a inevitable reality um, for us all. But I think it's something about the dynamics of the pandemic 
that makes it more real for people.